Right now on Morning News Now, the votes are in. Donald Trump taking home a fifth straight win against Nikki Haley. This is in Michigan's Republican primary. Now, both candidates looking ahead to Super Tuesday. It's going to be fantastic. We win Michigan. We win the whole thing. We don't anoint kings in America. We have elections. We give people choices. Plus, President Biden wins the Democratic primary despite protests over the Israel-Hamas war and his handling of it. We'll break it all down. Also this morning, down to the wire, just two days left for lawmakers to reach a deal to avert a government shutdown. We'll bring you the latest on talks between President Biden and congressional leaders. Plus, we're tracking extreme weather across much of the U.S., from wildfires in Texas to severe storms in the Midwest and Northeast. More on the storm systems making their way across several states. And Black Princess Magic, how one woman is inspiring little girls who look like her by playing Disney dress-up at their birthday parties. We'll have a live conversation with her. A great idea. Looking forward to that. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to get started this morning with the race for the White House. We are now closer to a likely rematch this fall in the general election between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. NBC News projects former President Trump is the winner in the Michigan Republican primary. He defeated his lone remaining rival, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, by more than 40 points. Mr. Trump won a portion of the delegates as he inches closer to the party's nomination. The majority of that state's delegates will actually be handed out this weekend at a state party convention. Mr. Trump called into a GOP watch party last night in Grand Rapids, addressing supporters. We have a very simple task. We have to win on November 5th, and we're going to win big, and it's going to be... Uh... It's going to be like nothing uh, that anybody has ever seen. We have the worst president in the history of our country, the most incompetent and the most corrupt president, and we can't let this continue. On the Democratic side, President Biden did win the Michigan primary by a wide margin, but more than 100,000 voters cast their ballots for uncommitted. For many, that was their way of protesting the president's response to the Israel-Hamas war. NBC News correspondent Von Hillier joins us now with the very latest on all this. So let's start with former President Trump's win in Michigan last night. So Nikki Haley has previously said her vote share indicates problems for Trump. Right. Is that still the case now? Right. Look, when you're talking about a Republican primary, a 40-point win is devastating. Mm. Nikki Haley got annihilated in this Republican primary. At the same time, she has made the case that she is sticking in this race to give voters, Republican voters around the country, the opportunity to vote for somebody that is not Donald Trump. And she continues to sound the alarm that, look, 26% of Republican voters said that they don't want Donald Trump to be their nominee, suggesting repeatedly that Donald Trump cannot win in November, and this is a testament and evidence of that. Now, we expect Nikki Haley to move forward through this process here, but the concern for Republicans is not only is she chipping away from independents, essentially helping Democrats make the case against Donald Trump, but also even conservatives who voted for Joe Biden in 2020. We're talking about in Michigan, right, a state that had a very narrow election win for Joe Biden. So for Donald Trump, having Nikki Haley in the race is not advantageous to him and his campaign and all. Let's talk about the Democratic side, President Biden. So we just had up on our screen a moment ago here, 13.2 percent of that vote went to that uncommitted part. President Biden did win. But but what do you think that says about the fact that that there was that significant number of a result? And again, this is over kind of a protest grassroots effort over his handling of the Israel Hamas war. Right, Savannah, this is kind of a similar conversation to the one happening on the Republican side. The question was how many folks were going to come out and actually select uncommitted instead of selecting Joe Biden. You had more than 100,000 come out and do just that. Of course, Michigan, with a major Arab American population who mm -hmm. has expressed outrage about the Biden administration's handling of the war in Gaza, and yet you saw Joe Biden still perform well. I think important context is back in 2012 when Barack Obama was running for re-election uncontested, that 11% of mm -hmm. Michigan Democrats then also selected uncommitted. Mm -hmm. So this 14% is not that much higher at the same time when you're talking about a major, major swing state like Michigan, every thousands of voter counts. And when you're talking about 100,000 voters, 
uh, actively going to the polls to select uncommitted, of course it's a concern for the Democrats. Let's look ahead. We do have a few contests coming up this weekend before Super Tuesday next week. I can't find a single place where Nikki Haley is expected to win. So what is next for her campaign? What right, does the road look like? <laughs> Nikki Haley can't identify a state. Her campaign hasn't attempted to identify a state that they think that, that she can win. On Saturday, you have Idaho, Michigan, Missouri uh, voters that are going to be taking part in selecting their delegates to the Republican convention this uh, July here. But when you're looking at the map on next Tuesday, uh, March 5th, that is what is called the Super Tuesday. More than a dozen states are going to have their Republican voters go to the polls, and that is going to be a decisive moment. Nikki Haley has said she will look at the future of her candidacy after that. But I think the context is between now and March 19th, you have 24 states voting. And mm. you said it, Joe, polling does not look good for her anywhere here. In real time, voters are voting by mail and early voting in all 24 of those states already. Mm. All right. Von Hilliard, thanks for joining us. Good to see thanks, you. Yeah, guys. great to have you on set with us. Well, now the latest crisis on Capitol Hill, where this morning Congress is running out of time to keep the government open again. Senators in both parties say they will likely need to pass another short-term funding bill to prevent a partial shutdown this weekend. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has the latest from Washington. Hey, Joe, good morning. And we are once again staring down the barrel of a possible government shutdown. It's set to take place this Friday. It is a little different than the shutdowns we've dealt with in the past in that this would only be a partial government shutdown, about a third of the government. It would impact departments like Veterans Affairs, the Food and Drug Administration, and the Transportation Department. But then a week later, there would be the possibility of the entire federal government shutting down. The lawmakers met at the White House yesterday. Uh, this was the top congressional leaders the Senate Majority Leader, Minority Leader, and of course the Speaker of the House and the Minority Leader in the House. Uh, while they did talk about the shutdown, a lot of the focus of their discussion was around that aid package that's designed to provide aid to both Ukraine and Israel. Now, both sides have said that they do not want a shutdown. They're going to do everything they possibly can to avoid a shutdown. And so that once again enters in the real possibility that they will pass some sort of a short-term spending deal to allow the talks to continue past the deadline. In fact, the Speaker of the House floating the new dates of March 8th and March 22nd as part of that two-tiered plan to fund the government. Still an open question, though, as to whether or not that is going to happen. Lawmakers uh, will return to Washington today. The Senate has already been in session. The House will return today. And, of course, against the backdrop of all of this, while they are still working to attempt to try to find a way through when it comes to funding the government, Hunter Biden, the president's son, will appear on Capitol Hill today for his closed-door deposition as the impeachment inquiry into President Biden continues. So it is going to be a very busy couple of days on Capitol Hill. Joe. All right, Ryan Nobles, thank you so much. As Ryan mentioned, Hunter Biden is set to testify today in a closed-door deposition. It's part of the House GOP impeachment inquiry into his father. Yeah, the deposition comes after Hunter's legal team initially refused House Republican subpoena for a private deposition, saying that he would only testify in public so his words could not be selectively leaked or manipulated. You might remember in January, Hunter and his attorney made a surprise appearance sitting in the audience at a House Oversight Committee meeting to vote on whether to hold him in contempt for refusing to appear before that same committee. The committee initially delayed that contempt vote before ultimately abandoning it. So how did we finally end up here? Let's bring in NBC News senior investigative producer Sarah Fitzpatrick, who will help us sort it all out. Mm -hmm. Sarah, good to have you with us. So today's deposition, it's really over a year in the making. How did the House GOP and Hunter Biden finally reach a deal after all this drama we've seen play out to have them testify and to do it behind closed doors? You're right. It's been a very, very long road. But ultimately, the stakes for both sides just became way too high. For House Republicans, they've made huge allegations. They've spent so much time, so many resources, and they're facing criticism internally and externally that they haven't produced clear evidence of a crime yet. For Hunter, he's facing serious charges in two separate cases, criminal cases related to taxes and the purchase of a gun. And those federal judges would not look favorably at him defying a subpoena and being held in contempt of Congress. It's just too risky, and so they made the choice to sit down. So today's deposition comes after a string of some major setbacks for Republicans who have been pushing this inquiry. So last week, that former FBI informant who Republicans had used to help to justify this probe was arrested and accused of making up a lot of the stories that he had shared about the Biden family. That informant has pleaded not guilty. But tell us, what can we expect today and what do Republicans hope to get out of Hunter Biden? 
We're going to see, we're going to hear, and of course, we're not going to get the transcript for several days, but what will happen in this closed door deposition will be Hunter Biden emphatically pushing back, talking directly to those members of Congress for the first time about the allegations that have been following him for years. He's going to acknowledge that he made, quote, mistakes, and he's going to talk about the role of his addiction in making those mistakes. But he's also very critically going to insist that his father, Joe Biden, had nothing to do with his businesses and did not benefit from them financially or otherwise. Republicans are going to focus on what they view as inconsistencies in prior witness statements, and they're going to drill down on phrasing in emails and other contemporaneous correspondence to try to get Hunter to acknowledge what they view as his selling of influence. Whether or not they're successful in that, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, realistically, how much further do you think Republicans can push this impeachment inquiry? I think the answer is not much. While staffers insist that there are still more investigative steps ahead, more interviews, more subpoenas, They've told us that they are aiming for a report on their investigation to be complete by the spring. But we'll have to see if they stick to that timeline. Savannah? Talking about subpoenas, I mean, James Comer and Jim Jordan subpoenaed Attorney General Merrick Garland for records yesterday. What more should we know about that? This is kind of an escalation in um, the kind of back and forth between the Hill and DOJ. House Republicans are looking for the underlying tapes, the tapes of the interview between the special counsel and President Joe Biden, because they want to see if those memory lapses, which the special counsel cited as kind of a key reason why they chose not to charge the president, if those memory lapses are kind of simple mistakes or whether or not they suggest something that's a real underlying problem about his memory or his competency and whether or not that's an issue for the American people come November. All right. Sarah Fitzpatrick, thanks for joining us this morning. Mm -hmm, thank you. Now let's go to Alabama where lawmakers are making a push to protect IVF treatments after several of the state's biggest clinics have paused services. It's the latest fallout from the Alabama Supreme Court's ruling that said frozen embryos are children. Here's NBC News correspondent Kathy Park with more. The backlash to the Alabama IVF ruling was swift, but this week, state lawmakers began moving toward preserving IVF treatments. Alabama moving one step closer to preserving access to in vitro fertilization. Relating to in vitro fertilization is referred to the Committee on Health Care. With new bills introduced by Republicans in the state Senate designed to protect IVF. We work to foster culture of life, and I anticipate that bill on my desk very shortly. Alabama Democrats introduced a similar bill in the House last week following the state Supreme Court's controversial ruling finding embryos are children. The ruling upending IVF procedures. Every one of the, the women here has invested, their families have invested emotion, time, and a ton of money. The Biden administration's top health official, Javier Becerra, in Birmingham, meeting with patients and providers. Hannah Miles has been trying to have a baby for three years. This is not an acceptable way to treat someone or families that are going through something so hard. This isn't um, a political talking point. She was weeks away from a scheduled embryo transfer when the ruling came down. It's like you already feel like you're being held hostage by IVF because it's my whole life. Now we're being held hostage by this ruling. Hannah's clinic has paused new IVF treatments, but for now, hers is moving forward. Having a child for you is priceless. Yes. Yep. You do everything that you can. Because what other choice do you have? Our thanks to Kathy Park for that report. Well, today, hundreds of Alabama IVF patients and other families plan to rally at the State House. They're hoping to send a message directly to lawmakers. Turning now to the extreme weather sweeping across the country. In Texas, the governor has issued a disaster declaration with at least six wildfires torching parts of the panhandle. The fires cover thousands of acres, forcing evacuations, including at Pantex. That's the country's main nuclear weapons assembly plant. On top of that, thousands in Texas are waking up without power this morning. In Illinois, severe storms produced multiple tornadoes across the state, causing damage to several areas, including Chicago. Some areas even got hit with hail the size of golf balls. And blizzard conditions in North Dakota force residents to break out their snow shovels. Some spots are seeing up to 10 inches of snow, with winds reaching nearly 60 
miles an hour. Let's bring in meteorologist Angie Lastman. He's tracking the weather all across the country. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. It's been a, a wild 24 hours of weather in, in a lot of spots across the country. We still, of course, are dealing with that severe threat. Let's focus on that first because we do still have some of these tornado watches that are going to remain in effect at least until mid-morning as this line of really strong storms continues marching across portions of the Tennessee and Ohio valleys. That's where we see uh, the really robust thunderstorm, plenty of lightning associated with that, and you notice all of these thunderstorm warnings that are in effect across portions of Kentucky. Uh, and this is something that we'll watch at least, like I said, through mid-morning, potentially even later into the into the morning hours and into early afternoon, we could still be dealing with some of these stronger storms. This is the system that's really the culprit of this kind of weather whiplash that we're seeing across this region over the next 48 hours. It is going to bring a, kind of a messy commute to folks up and down the I-95 corridor, especially as we get into this evening's commute. It'll be mostly rain, some snow into part of, of the uh, interior areas of the Northeast and New England, but it's mostly going to be that heavy rain. Uh, we likely are going to see this, again, impacting folks as they try to head home later today. Here's the area, though, that we could see some of the stronger storms. The threat for severe weather much lower into the afternoon hours today than it was, say, yesterday across parts of the Midwest, but it's not zero. So Burlington, down through Scranton, Pittsburgh, and down as far south as Knoxville could see some of those stronger storms develop. We're talking some hail, maybe some strong wind gusts. Uh, the, the hail threat is fairly low. An isolated tornado can't rule it out, but that's also fairly low. I would say that the strong wind gusts, 50, 60 miles per hour, are what we're more on tap for. Uh, as far as rain is concerned, inch to two inches is going to be some of the higher amounts that we'll see in some of the interior areas, like I mentioned, of the northeast could pick up an inch or two of snow. Nothing too impressive, but we will see uh, quite impressive winds. We've got 135 million people under these wind alerts. It stretches from parts of the southern plains up into the northeast. Still includes parts of the Midwest as well, Michigan, Ohio. And look at these wind speeds, up to, up to 43 miles per hour in places like Chicago today, 39 miles per hour in New York, mid-40s for folks in Washington, D.C. So I wouldn't be surprised if we still see some down power lines, maybe some down trees. And guys, uh, behind this system, really cold air working in. It's going to be a, a bit of a doozy for people that maybe had their shorts and T-shirts on <laughs> yesterday in places like Chicago where it was mid-70s. Today, 27 degrees yeah. for their high there. It's, it's a little February. dose of reality. It's <laughs> a February. dose of reality, exactly. indeed. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Angie. Angie. Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, new concerns about headphones and children's hearing. What a new study shows and what you can do to protect your kids' ears. Up first, though, after the break, the stage is set for a gun rights showdown at the Supreme Court. We'll break down the case over bump stocks, as they're called, that could impact laws across the country. We will be right back. Welcome back. A jury found two men guilty of murdering hip-hop icon Jam Master Jay. The convictions come more than 20 years after his death. Prosecutors say Carl Jordan Jr. and Ronald Washington killed Jam Master Jay during a drug deal in the New York City recording studio. It happened back in 2002. The men each face at least 20 years in prison. Jam Master Jay was a member of the legendary rap group Run DMC. He was considered a pioneer of the hip-hop movement. The Supreme Court is set to hear arguments in a case that could change gun rights across the country. Both the Biden administration and gun rights activists appealed to the higher court, asking the justices to review a 2019 ban on bump stocks. Bump stocks make it possible for semi-automatic rifles to fire more rapidly. They were banned under the Trump administration following the Las Vegas mass shooting in 2017. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos is here with us. Danny, good morning. So this case sort of seems to come down to what qualifies as a machine gun. Walk us through the arguments presented by both sides here. This is not really a case about whether bump stocks are a good idea. This is really a classic example of sometimes Congress is stuck with the words it uses in a statute. Mm -hmm. Congress decided to define a machine gun, which are items that have been illegal for a long time, as something for which one pull of the trigger expels more than one round. In other words, a semi-automatic gun is one pull of the trigger, one round. Anytime you have multiple bullets coming out from mm. one pull of the trigger, that is a machine gun. They did not define it by rate of fire. They didn't say 650 rounds per minute shall be a machine gun. Mm. And for that reason, what a bump stock does is it basically makes your finger bionic. That's the best way I can describe it. Now, all of us have limitations, human limitations on our finger. Imagine if you were born with a mutation and you could pull your, finger tri your trigger finger hundreds of times, 600 times in a minute. Hmm. Your firearm would not thereby be illegal. That's the argument with bump stocks. All they do 
is allow you to pull a trigger many times faster than a human normally could. Over the past few years, we know gun rights advocates have tried to challenge these bans on bump stocks. They haven't been successful, though, right? They have at least once in D.C. That D.C. court has concluded that, as, as I think you could, that, hey, well, this regulation never really imagined bump stocks. The spirit of a machine gun is satisfied by a bump stock, if not the literal definition. But meanwhile, two other circuit courts of appeal have gone the other way, saying, listen, Congress defined it as one pull, one bullet, and that's what's happening mm. technically with a bump stock, just at an increased rate of speed. So the Supreme Court actually agreed to hear two additional cases on gun rights just last week. What kind of implications could those cases have kind of make this paint this whole picture for us with all of these headed to the Supreme Court? In one case, it's really a First Amendment case, and it's a case where it, the state of New York, an agency sent a memo to banks saying, hey, you guys ought to be, or financial institutions, I should say, saying you ought to be really careful who you associate with. And the NRA says, hey, you know, that's coercion by the state. It infringes on our First Amendment rights. But far more interesting to me... Mm is a case called Rahimi, maybe more interesting than bump stocks, because bump stocks are kind of a rarity unless they result in a national tragedy. But something that affects mm. everyday ownership is a federal statute, 922. I've dealt with it many times. I've got a case with it right now where it prohibits certain people from owning firearms. But ever since the Supreme Court's uh, decision in Bruin just a couple years ago, all of those statutes, both federal and state, are up in the air because we mm. don't know what exactly states and the federal government can prohibit people from owning. We know that they can prohibit some violent felons. We know they can prohibit some other people. But can you prohibit someone with a domestic violence order? Mm. Uh, can you prohibit somebody who's a, a misdemeanor convicted, has a misdemeanor conviction, a nonviolent felony? Mm. All of those rules are covered under federal statutes and state statutes. And now it's a big question mark. I literally have this in one of my cases right now. It is a big unknown. Mm. Danny Savalos, thank you so much, as always. Coming up, it could be a clue pointing to Alzheimer's disease. When we come back, what new research shows about a link between belly fat and the brain. Plus, it's realistic and potentially problematic why critics are sounding the alarm about images created by artificial intelligence. This is Morning News Now. Now with our weekly medical checkup, this week we're digging into a new study that suggests team sports may not only improve your kids' mental health, but they could also save the U.S. economy billions of dollars. Can't wait to hear that one. Plus, doctors think they may have found a link between belly fat and brain health. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now with more on these studies. So let's talk about the growing concerns over headphones and yeah. earbud, yeah. earbud use with kids. There's a new national poll from C.S. Mott Children's Hospital found most parents say their kids are using them mm -hmm. and for extended periods mm. of of time. Yes. What are the worries here? You know, this poll came at an interesting time because a couple of months ago, the American Academy of Pediatrics also sounded the alarm on this. The concern is not just about hearing loss and, and ringing in the ears, because that's definitely an issue, but mm. using earbuds and using headphones all the time, if it disrupts your children, it can disrupt sleep and learning and language. And so this poll found, yes, two-thirds of parents are saying that kids are using them, not surprisingly, but one in six are using them for more than two hours, which is definitely beyond what we want, and we'll talk about wow. those recommendations in a second. Half of parents, however, are saying that their kids are using them for less than an hour, which is good. My doctor's right. orders here are this. If you are a parent, and you're, this was a poll done between kids 5 and 12 years old, you have the ability to set these controls, right? You have to look at your kid's phone. You have to look at their devices. This is what pediatricians say. Remember the 60-60 rule. Not more than 60 minutes a day and not more than 60% of maximum volume is what the kids oh. should, be, should be listening to. Um, the other thing hmm. is to look for signs of hearing loss. So your kids may be experiencing, once you lose noise-induced hearing loss, you do not get it back. You have one sense of hearing. Don't mess it up. Um, but things like speaking loudly, asking to repeat, those are like could be little signs and symptoms that your child may already be experiencing some hearing loss mm. and you should have them checked out by, an, by a professional. Really good advice. Okay, yeah. let's talk about this belly fat brain health connection. This is out of Rutgers mm -hmm. and tell us about this study and what it tells us. Okay, so first of all, just this is a unique study because this was actually studying the association between belly fat and the risk of cognitive decline or basically an association with brain health. The people who were in this study were children of people with Alzheimer's. So we know that they were already at a okay. greater risk. Hmm. And what they found for men only is that if they had a greater amount of fat around their pancreas, it was linked to poorer uh, performance in cognitive studies as well as a decline in brain volume. And you say, 
why would that be? Uh -huh. What is the pancreas brain connection? Right. Maybe it has to do with insulin, for example. If your body's not producing enough insulin, you're going to have insulin resistance. And we know that type 2 diabetes is a risk hmm. factor for dementia. My doctor's orders are this. Abdominal fat is not good. Fat around the pancreas, fat around the liver, visceral fat, we know that that is something that's part of what we brought more broadly call the metabolic syndrome. Okay. You need to know about this. This fat in this area, I'm gonna like really like um, telescope this out to everybody, is not a good thing. Weight loss is the number one thing you need to do here. But again, with the metabolic syndrome, it's type 2 diabetes, high triglycerides, insulin resistance. These are all things that you can control and treat to prevent down the line heart disease as well as brain disease. What you eat is obviously key to all that, especially exactly. the insulin factor Exactly, all exactly. All right, finally, I want to ask you about a new report from the American Journal of Preventative Medicine. It suggests encouraging kids to play team sports. We know it could improve their mental health. Yes. That's one thing. It could also save the U.S. economy a lot of money. Okay. So I think yeah, I'm what? interpreting this study right when I'm going to say that it seems like <laughs> it's an AI-generated model of kids and their participation in sports. And basically what they have determined is that if kids increase even by about 10 percent their involvement in organized team sports down the line, that will help prevent metabolic disease, overweight and obesity, as well as improve their mental health, which will in turn save the U.S. economy billions of dollars. It's a different way to approach get out and move. But, you know, I mean, I think that we use AI for a lot of different things, mm -hmm. right? It's just mm -hmm. new to medicine, if you will. So my doctor's orders are, I always say this as mom and doctor at the, <laughs> at the desk, get your kids involved in team sports, <laughs> start them young. They start to learn all of these healthy behaviors. We know how good it is for them psychosocially, but, but we can't leave without like a little, you know, black fly in, the, in, the, mm -hmm. in there somewhere, watch out for burnout. Mm -hmm. um, the American Academy of Pa Pediatrics, again, released a report last year being really like aware of this, one to two days a week off every week, one to two months off every year of your sport, to really be aware if their performance starts to decline, you need to think about burnout. So it's like that Goldilocks amount of involvement and you know pushing kids, but also not pushing them too far. All right, very good. Mom, doctor, and today, economist, mm -hmm. Dr. <laughs> yes. Natalie Azar, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, now we have a disturbing story on one of the more harmful uses of AI. That's just how easy it can be to create highly realistic fake images, including pornographic images of celebrities, but also even young children. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has more. It's the latest incident of a new and insidious form of bullying. A group of students at a Beverly Hills middle school creating deep fake pornographic images of their classmates, swapping the faces of their peers onto pictures of nude bodies. I'm very disappointed. The school alerting parents after the images were shared among students via text. Beverly Hills police are now assisting in the investigation. This is a new unchartered territory when it comes to um, uh, information that's being you know, created and disseminated. The disturbing incident happening just weeks after fake nude images of Taylor Swift appeared online. District Superintendent Michael Bragge sees a connection. I do believe that that played a, a big part in our students becoming aware of what's possible with the technology. This technology is easy to use and so easily accessible. They can get it right on their phones, instantaneously create content, and then send it anywhere. AI still so new, this all falls into a legal gray area. Experts say it's still unclear if the fake images are even child pornography. Why are there not more legal protections to prevent this type of incident from happening right now? This is one of the situations where law is oftentimes chasing after technology. A federal bill aims to criminalize sharing sexually explicit deepfake photos, but it's stalled in Congress. The images can last forever. Ever, yeah. If your image is already being flawed at this young age, it can really have an impact on their mental health. Parents tell us it's an issue that cannot wait. Liz Kreutz, NBC News, Los Angeles. Well, let's continue the conversation with futurist and founder of the tech company Way, Sinead Bavel. Sinead, always great to have you join us. Thanks for being here. So from what you know about AI and this technology, are there ways to prevent the creation of these disturbing images in sensitive places like schools when we're talking about kids? Yes, this is that's 
part of the challenge here. These tools are becoming incredibly accessible and very easy to use. On the one hand, you could look at broader protections, such as limiting the, the data that's available about you online, uh, especially when it comes to higher quality photos and things. You can make your social media uh, profiles private and ensure you're only sharing content with people that you trust. And there are aspects of being able to distort images or there's technical programs where you can distort the images you upload. So they're not easily, they're not, they can't be processed by AI very easily. But these aren't foolproof or entirely realistic expectations in the modern digital age, especially if you're in high school, right? You might have a social media account. And even if you don't, I'm sure there's photos of you uh, with your friends or in school yearbooks. And moreover, you know, these incidents, they're happening at high schools where interactions are predominantly within a known community. There's a reasonable expectation for trust and safety in digital sharing here, which is why I think we need to step back and look at more broader legislation legislative um, pathways to prevent the creation of this, or at least deter it before this content uh, is even brought out. You know, these concerns are reflected in a recent poll from the Pew Research Center, which found Americans are now more concerned than excited about mm -hmm. AI and its potential. How can we balance everything that AI is capable of while also keep it from becoming too damaging so mm -hmm. people do have a little more faith in it? Right, because there are so many ways that AI is going to change society for the better. Uh, and I largely think that that's going to be the case. Uh, however, right now, it feels like we're almost playing AI whack-a-mole. Uh, and every time there's this new uh, capability of AI, we then kind of scramble behind it uh, to try to figure out how we do this safely. So one, I think we need to think about hardening our institutions for the AI age. What does it mean to perhaps incorporate more foresight at a government level, uh, at the Department of Education level, so we do have a little bit more time to prepare uh, and it doesn't always feel like a mad scramble towards the end and that means we're maybe adding more flexible ways we can adapt and evolve alongside uh, the technology while also ensuring that the core aspects of institutions stay fixed and, and structured. Is there any way we can personally protect ourselves from fake AI creations? I mean, I've seen myself how simple it is to actually create these images or, or some of the audio, that type of stuff. I mean, how can you try to not end up in a situation like this? Again, it would come down to limiting uh, how much you share online and your digital footprint. I know this is really hard in the modern age, which is why it's not a fully practical solution, but keeping your social media accounts private uh, can be a lot more helpful. Ensuring that what you do share is with people that you trust. Uh, you can as well look into some of the, the technical programs that allow you to distort some of the images uh, before you upload them. And that doesn't change how we see them as humans, but it changes what AI can see and process. So that would be my advice there. But I do think we need broader government legislative support here because this isn't something that citizens on their own can really deal with or, or grapple with. Sinead Bovell, as always, we appreciate when you join us. Thanks so much. Coming up, a golden ticket to nowhere, an immersive Willy Wonka themed experience. Well, it turned out to be a world of pure imagination. We're going to show you what they found that had some parents actually calling the cops. And you could say she's breaking the glass slipper. We'll talk to one woman who's inspiring girls who look like her with a little black princess magic. Stay with us. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. It was billed as a chocolate fantasy like never before, where dreams become reality. And the families who went along to an immersive Willy Wonka experience in Scotland soon realized they hadn't exactly got a golden ticket. They found a near-empty warehouse decorated with a handful of props and a small bounce house. NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung reports on the sweet occasion that turned quite bitter. Boys and girls, the chocolate room. A world of pure imagination gone wrong. My name is Willy Wonka. Riding the popularity of the hit movie Wonka, a new event in Glasgow, Willy's Chocolate Experience. AI-generated images promising a whimsical day for kids with an enchanting garden, live performances, and character appearances, including Oompa Loompas, all for about 45 bucks. 
Instead, a near-empty warehouse, a bouncy castle with wooden tables set up, some janky props of candy, reports of kids crying. You've paid money. There's children here. Our partners at Sky interviewing one actor who played Willy Wonka and described the event as a place where dreams went to die. Scottish police even got called to the scene. The event's organizer, Billy Cowell, claiming the issue is a holographic paper that didn't come in time. His company, House of Illuminati, apologizing and claiming on Facebook that they've refunded more than 800 people. But numerous people in a growing Facebook group talking about the event say they haven't gotten their money back yet. The event venue telling NBC News they'll offer their place free of charge, saying the event hosts, quote, either have no regards for the families and young children they have disappointed or are too embarrassed to comment. All of it giving shades of fire festival, just with a handful of candy instead of those cheap looking sandwiches and kids the victims instead of concert goers. Thanks to Brian Chung for that report. To further highlight the potential perils of AI, two actors hired for the event told NBC News they were promised 500 pounds to perform that weekend. That's about $630. They say the script had gibberish wording, claiming it appeared to be AI generated. At least the ticket was cheaper than Fire Festival. There you, it's true. It's <laughs> and no true. travel required. No travel required. Well, but what if you went <laughs> well, that's there true. for yes. the Willy Wonka if you did that, I, world? I am really very sorry. <laughs> sorry. All right. Let's see what's making financial headlines this morning. Apple is putting plans for an electric vehicle in park. CNBC Savannah Hanau joins us with that in other news. Savannah, good morning. Hey guys, good morning to you. All right, well, Apple has scrapped plans to develop an electric car after a decade of work. Bloomberg first reported the company announced the news internally yesterday. Many of those on the 2000 person team will shift to Apple's generative AI projects. There will reportedly be some layoffs, but it's not clear how many. Apple's electric car ambitions have been rumored for years, and recent reports actually suggested it was still working on the project, although the expected launch had been pushed out to 2028. Apple hasn't commented publicly. Separately, Apple executives and lawyers met with Justice Department officials last week to try to persuade the agency not to file an antitrust lawsuit against the company. Bloomberg reports the government, which has been probing Apple since 2019, alleges it imposed software and hardware limitations on the iPhone and iPad to hinder rivals. A lawsuit could be filed as soon as the end of March. And more songs are being pulled from TikTok because of the licensing dispute with Universal Music. These include songs by SZA and Doja Cat and Mariah Carey's holiday hit, All I Want for Christmas is You. Universal Music claims TikTok isn't paying or protecting its artists enough. Songs by artists including Taylor Swift, Billie Eilish, Adele, and Bad Bunny were either removed or muted from TikTok videos on February 1st, guys. Well, you keep coming across those muted videos, and you're like, ah. Yeah. Oh. The Brian What's Carey, all they want yeah. for Christmas. It's like yeah. half the videos on TikTok during the holidays, God, right? right? <laughs> okay, thanks, Savannah, appreciate Thank it. Thank you. you got it. All right, whether it's Elsa, Rapunzel, or Cinderella, actors dressed up as favorite princesses are a staple of kids' parties, but the industry hasn't always been great at reflecting the diversity of children celebrating. So our next guest decided to change that, breaking glass slippers, so to speak. <laughs> Simone Brown started her own Black Princess for Hire company, dressing up as characters who aren't traditionally black, at least in those original movies. And Simone, she's the founder of Black Princess Parties DMB, joins us now. Good morning. Thank you so much, Simone, for joining us. What a fun idea this is. But I do understand that this story came out of, you know, some difficult experiences with representation for you as a kid. I know that you were told you couldn't be a princess. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that and what kind of sparked this idea? Yes, um, when I was in the sixth grade, I had the opportunity to play my first lead role. And typically lead roles went to older students and that role was Cinderella. And so I think there was a bit of an issue there because I was younger and because I did not have the traditional look. Even though the Brandy Cinderella movie had come out, I think still in people's heads, they think the cartoon when they think Cinderella. So when a kid sees a princess who does look like them, what's the impact of that? Oh, it makes me feel amazing. <laughs> they will say things like, your hair looks just like mine when I have locks or braids. Um, when I perform Tiana, I usually wear my natural hair and all their curls so they can see how beautiful that is. And that's how their hair grows. So I want them to see that their skin is worthy of being a princess, their hair is worthy of being a princess. Everything mm -hmm. about them is worthy and beautiful. 
Do you have a specific memory of a child who, you know, really had such a beautiful reaction to seeing you in costume? Yes, I had two that are my favorite. Um, I had did a Tiana, and she said, you look just like me, and that was very special. I've also done parties for kids who are not of color, and I was Elsa at that party, and they were holding up their Elsa dolls and their Elsa pajamas and saying, that's you right there. And that was mm -hmm. extremely special because they were able to see the character, see the joy, see the fun, and not let skin color get in the way of that. Mm. You know, last year we saw this reaction by some to Halle Bailey being cast to play Ariel in The Little Mermaid, who was spectacular, by the way. Yes. What does need to happen um, in the entertainment industry to make sure we see more stories like mm. that told? In the entertainment industry, I guess I would like to see more open-mindedness and more consideration for the talent that is there and less consideration for the way things have always been done. I think that's what was really special about seeing Hallie. She could sing it, she could act it, she was perfect in the role. And that's what really matters to me as an entertainer to be able to do the role justice especially when skin color is no part of telling the story. Mm. I just watched that movie recently. She really was so fantastic. Did she nail the, the, the main song? Yes. Uh, part uh, of your world? My it's gosh, so good. Absolutely. Chills. And I forgot, by the way, how like stressful that movie is. It was like, <laughs> so surprised. Um, so one last very quick question for you. What's your most requested costume? My most requested is probably Tiana and Elsa. But my favorite is Rapunzel oh. because I got to make this beautiful faux lox <laughs> wig. I know. Look at that. <laughs> I love it. Simone Brown, thank you so much. Great idea. And we appreciate you being up early and sharing it with us. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Coming up, the stage is set for an incredible season on Broadway. A big season on Broadway. When we come back, we're going to pull back the curtain on 18 new shows wow. set to start this spring. Stay with us. You're watching Morning News now. It is going to be a busy couple months on Broadway. There no are kidding. 18, 18 new shows opening in March and April. Yeah, whether you prefer musicals, plays, revivals, or cutting edge new shows, there is bound to be something for everyone. And by the way, I think all of those are for Joe. Well, we'll see. <laughs> I, I'm going to do my best. And so is Felicia Fitzpatrick, who's joining us now. I, I was making my calendar last <laughs> week. Yes, see? And I don't even know how April is going to be possible to see all of the shows. I mean, what is going on here? Why are we seeing this spring awakening on Broadway? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is good, Joe. I always love that. I love your enthusiasm for Broadway. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a no stream April if you love Broadway. So I think it, it, there's basically something for everyone. And we see this every season that shows open in April because people are trying to uh, hit the cutoff right before the Tony nomination. So, yes, there's going to be 18 new shows, and 11 of those alone are going to be opening over a nine day stretch in late oh, April. Goodness. Um, I know it's going to be wild, but I'm excited too. I was making my calendar the other day, Joe, so we're ready and I'm excited for us. <laughs> All right, so help somebody who's less in the know than y'all are. If you're feeling overwhelmed by those numbers and you don't even know where to start, how would you try to help somebody figure out what they might like to see? I definitely say go to social media, you know, look up the, the show's trailers on YouTube or their website, and you'll, you'll kind of see what the vibe is for each one and if it resonates with you. But I think it's also helpful to kind of think of buckets. So if you love mm. pop music, jukebox musicals, you know, Alicia mm. Keys has a musical coming, Hell's Kitchen. Wow. The Who's Tommy revival is coming back, which everyone's excited for. And Huey Lewis is doing The Heart of Rock and Roll. Or if you're like, I love book adaptations, they have The Notebook, The Great Gatsby, Water for Elephants is coming. Ooh. And then if you really want to see some celebrities, you have Steve Carell and William Jackson Harper and Uncle Vanya. And Succession's Jeremy Strong is going to be in um, An Enemy of the People. Yeah, oh, wow. there are a lot so of Rachel McAdams who are going to be in these shows. You. Yeah, Ra oh, yeah, yeah, Rachel McAdams. Yeah, it, so it there's is like, very you see now. Now. <laughs> <laughs> now we got someone's we got attention. It is, it is amazing. There. You talk about book adaptations for a lot of people. Those are going to be movie adaptations because the movies are made right. from the books. But True. I mean, what? True. And I'm surprised how many of those there are. I'm surprised how many are actually new musicals. Mm. Um, what mm. are you most excited about, Felicia? This question, Felicia's picks, it's always so hard when people ask me for that because I am so excited for everything, but I think if I had to really, 
you know, narrow it down based off of recommendations and, and properties that I love. I am really excited for the Wiz revival that's coming. It's been touring across the country. I'm, I've never seen a live production of it, so I'm excited for that. The Great Gatsby that was at Paper Mill, people are excited for that. And then, of course, I grew up with Alicia Keys, so Hell's Kitchen is going to be a great one. And Cabaret from the West End, I'm also very intrigued by. Because that is going to be, first of all, it's Eddie Redmayne, right? And also, it's, it's an oh. immersive experience. It's not your typical theater experience, right? It's, You'll be in the Kit Kat Club, ready to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. whenever you've described a show like that to yeah. me, I'm like, okay, that sounds. We had Here Lies cool. Love last year, which yeah. is like that things that sort of break the fourth wall down a little bit more. Yeah, I love so. it. I feel like Joe will be ready for the audience participation. You know. Yeah. Right. I feel like. I mean, did you just say, Joe? Did you do you know the cast of all 18? <laughs> no, I do not. Probably. <laughs> Seems like you might. But I know a good chunk. So, <laughs> Alicia Fitzpatrick, always good to have you on. Um, you. Good luck, Thank wishing you. you get lots of rest and, yeah. and vitamin you. C and everything for the season ahead. <laughs> I know. Thank I'll go so see much, some. You recommend it. We'll figure or it we'll out. Or we'll go. All right. All right. There we go. Thanks, Felicia. Finally, this hour, there is a new fitness routine that works on quieting your mind by keeping it busy with beats. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz gives us the lowdown on what could be the next big workout for your body and your brain. Mm. The sounds and rhythms of life are all around us. The tick of a clock. The snap, snap, snap of a jump rope. The beat of a drum. Rhythm is the mind identifying and, and, and living with patterns. Mm -hmm. Heartbeat, breath, the cadence of your speech, the, the gait of your walk. From that vision, drum boxing was born. 180, left, left, right. The brainchild of percussionist John Wakefield and professional volleyball player Christina Hines. Drum boxing is a new fitness regime for not only your body, but your mind. This is kind of brain fitness in motion. Intrigued, I decided to take the class. I think I'm getting it. The workout combines the movements of boxing with the beats of drumming in ever-changing sequences and combinations. We use rhythm as a the real cornerstone of this. So these drums, we move around them, put you in different patterns, and then things change. It's the variability that really sets this apart. That variability, which challenges the brain and working memory, has scientists intrigued. If I say five. When you are doing something where you have to keep multiple short-term memory short little programs in mind, that's really one of the most effective cognitive workouts that we can have for the brain. Mistakes are expected and often the point, what? something what? I learned almost immediately. I have no idea what I'm going to describe it. It's actually the process that's important. And without the mistakes, this training wouldn't be effective because that's where we really, you know, you figure out how to move forward, how to go to that next thing. So I'm, what I'm hearing is lean into my mistakes. Lean into them, own okay. them, and just keep the beat. It's Genesis 14 years ago in the sweat and grit of a boxing gym. I'd never been in like a real boxing gym. And just the sound. It was, there was just rhythm everywhere. It was immediate and it was a visceral reaction and I just felt like I was home. John, who's a percussionist for the LA Opera, was asked to work with one of the fighters who was hoping to infuse some rhythm into his movement. So we sat down with some congas and just started playing. Immediately I noticed how the changing tempos, changing rhythms, changing patterns on the drums really engaged his focus in a way that I wasn't always seeing in other parts of his training. So that's what I started to lean into. That experience changed his life. So he started researching the science of the brain. That's how he met Christina, who was researching flow state at USC. What is flow state? We're realizing that this is a, the state of peak performance. And it's where, it's where you're happiest and you can perform the best. And you're not thinking about anything else. You're in the present moment. John introduced her to drum boxing and she was hooked. He created something that's actually a flow state experience. You can't not get into it when you're doing it. So they created a class. First in her backyard, a few people, a few drums. Then as the pandemic was winding down, they opened this studio. Since then, momentum has been building and the reviews stellar. What is it that you love about it so much? I think this is the only work I've ever found that you can completely clear your mind. It's more than a physical workout. It's a mindfulness practice. Mind and body in motion.
Our thanks to Liz for working that out I for bet. us. I know I was going to say I don't have rhythm, and I'm also bad at working out, so I feel like <laughs> that is a recipe things. for. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, I took the you percussion. There. Did you take the percussion test in elementary school yeah. for band? And <laughs> they were like, bad. No. <laughs> not for you. Right, here's your baritone. All right. <laughs> it's interesting when you think about it because if you try just you know actual drumming on a drum set, it is very hard. Yes, exactly. Because of the coordination. So yeah. if you're like working out and you're, that's a lot going on at once. So I, I picture a band forming out of that or something. Yeah. All right, that's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. Stay with us. The news continues right now. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, another blowout victory for former President Trump. NBC News projects that he handily beat rival Nikki Haley in Michigan overnight. It's been a clean sweep so far for Mr. Trump. So what does that mean for Haley's future? heading into the pivotal Super Tuesday contest. And on the Democratic side, another win for President Biden. That's not the whole story. We're going to explain in a moment. It's deja vu on Capitol Hill. Congress is staring down yet another shutdown threat. The dueling deadlines that could shutter some federal programs as early as this Friday if a deal is not reached. States of emergency, we're also tracking that massive winter storm system tearing across the country. It's bringing golf ball sized hail and dangerous tornadoes to the Midwest, even briefly halting flights at one of America's busiest airports. Well, in Texas, a disaster declaration from Governor Greg Abbott over widespread wildfires. We're covering it all as the wild weather sets its sights on the East Coast. And later in the hour, we're talking dupes for deals. It's the latest social media sensation that has got frugal TikTokers chasing cheaper brands, all in the name of fighting inflation. I dupes. see a lot of those videos. Exactly. Dupes becoming a very popular yes. thing nowadays yeah. as we deal with higher prices right. for things. Let's begin this hour in Michigan, where voters have made their voices heard as another presidential primary is now in the books. NBC News projects former President Donald Trump has won the Michigan Republican primary, defeating former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley for a fifth straight time. The win moves him closer to clinching the party's nomination and setting up a likely rematch against President Biden. Meanwhile, Biden came out on top in the Michigan Democratic primary as well, but more than 100,000 people voted uncommitted. That was in protest of his response to the Israel-Hamas war for some of those voters. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has the latest on the state of the race. John Savannah, good morning. Michigan, of course, is expected to be one of the closest swing states this November. And now a group protesting President Biden and the war in Gaza managed to get more than 100,000 votes. This morning, President Biden and former President Trump coming off huge wins in Michigan. We demand a permanent ceasefire now. But it's these voters who shook up the Democratic primary. If he doesn't get it together and change what he's doing, we will not vote for him in November. Overnight, an extremely unusual watch party for voters who cast their ballots not for a candidate, but for uncommitted in protest of President Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. I didn't feel good about voting for Joe Biden. Um, he's been pretty complicit about the genocide happening in Palestine. The effort's organizers had set their goal at 10,000 votes. They got more than 10 times that. You voted for President Biden in 2020, so you think in November you might vote for former President Trump? Correct. Here in Dearborn, Arab Americans make up a majority of the population. Longtime Democrat Ramsey Kassam told me he was furious with the Biden administration over the death toll in Gaza. I think it's a great idea to volunteer to send that message. The Biden campaign points out, overall, uncommitted only got 13 percent of the vote, about the same percentage as some previous primaries. Still, Donald Trump only beat Hillary Clinton in 2016 by 10,000 votes in Michigan. President Biden won the crucial swing state in 2020 by about 150,000. So any protest votes could be critical come November. On the Republican side of the race, Mr. Trump has now swept the first five contests and called to thank Michigan supporters overnight. I'm so proud of the results because they're far greater than anticipated. But his rival, Nikki Haley, says under the former president, Republicans have actually lost ground as she moves on to Super Tuesday states, insisting she's not dropping out. And if states like Colorado and Michigan and Minnesota want to start winning again, you have to have somebody on the ticket that can win a general election.
Back here in Battleground, Michigan, the president's initial statement overnight made no mention of the uncommitted vote. But this morning, a senior campaign advisor says that the president shares the same goal as many of those who voted uncommitted, which is an end to the violence. Joan Savannah. All right, Gabe, thank you. This morning, the threat of another government shutdown is looming large on Capitol Hill. A partial stoppage now could just be two days away unless Congress acts swiftly. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles is in Washington with the latest. Ryan, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. And here we go again. Congress staring down the possibility of another government shutdown. This one, though, is a little bit different. Things like national parks and zoos are not under immediate threat. That's because there are two different deadlines impacting different parts of the government. That first deadline is this Friday. Once again, Congress is on the verge of doing something they all agree is a bad idea. It's so clear that we can't have the shutdown. There's no need for a shutdown, though. Lawmakers are scrambling to pass a spending bill that will avoid a government shutdown that could come in two phases. The first deadline set for Friday. It will not mean national parks will close or that padlocks will be put on the gates of zoos. It will, however, impact roughly one third of the federal government. Funding for departments like agriculture, the Food and Drug Administration, Veterans Affairs, transportation, and housing and urban development are all set to expire. Some services for veterans across the country would be in jeopardy, and any new hires of air traffic controllers would stop. In total, some 630,000 federal workers will stop getting a paycheck. Most will still have to show up for work, though, because they are considered essential. And a recently passed law guarantees they will get back pay once the government reopens. On Tuesday, the four congressional leaders met with President Biden. And I'm cautiously optimistic uh, that we can do what is necessary within the next day or so to close down these bills and avoid a government shutdown. House Speaker Mike Johnson is the wild card. He needs to find a way to bring a bill to the floor that will get enough votes without alienating conservative Republicans who could threaten his job as Speaker, a goal he promised to reach. We believe that we can get to agreement on these issues and prevent a government shutdown, and that's our first uh, responsibility. And even if lawmakers do avoid this first stage of the shutdown on Friday, one le week later they face an even tougher task as the budgets of major departments like defense, commerce, homeland security, education, and state are all set to expire. Joe? So, Ryan, you're going to be busy today. The president's son, Hunter Biden, also scheduled to be on the Hill today. Talk more about that. Yeah, that's right, Joe. Hunter Biden finally appearing before the House committees investigating his father as part of their impeachment inquiry. Now, his appearance is behind closed doors, and it comes after House Republicans threatened to hold him in contempt. Now, Republicans are still in search of some sort of direct evidence that the president was involved in Hunter's foreign business dealings. This, as this impeachment inquiry right now, is on shaky ground. Joe. All right, Ryan Nobles. Ryan, thank you. Well, turning now to Georgia, where one key witness gave critical testimony in the hearing to remove Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis from former President Trump's election interference case. The defense tried to zero in on when the personal relationship between Willis and Nathan Wade, a prosecutor Willis hired to help lead the case, actually began. NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard has more. A key witness in the hearing on whether to disqualify Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis in the Trump election interference case under intense questioning. Do you recall any other thing at this point in time under oath that would indicate when the relationship started between Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis? I do not know when the relationship started between Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis. I cannot recall that. Terrence Bradley, the former law partner of special prosecutor Nathan Wade, repeatedly asked when Wade's relationship with Willis began. At one point, he was asked about a text message where he said the relationship began before Willis hired Wade. I was speculating. Why would you speculate when she was asking you a direct question about when the relationship started? I have no answer for that except for the fact that you do in fact know when it started and you don't want to testify to that 
in court. It was two weeks ago that Willis defiantly took the stand and lashed out at defense attorneys trying to remove her from the case. You and Mr. Wade met in October 2019 at a conference? That is correct. And I think in one of your motions you tried to implicate and slept with him at that conference, which I find to be extremely offensive. In testimony, Willis saying the relationship began after she had appointed Wade to the special prosecutor position. Asking you whether or not prior to November 1st of 2021, there was a romantic relationship with Mr. Wade. It's very simple. It's either a yes or a no. I don't consider my relationship with him to be romantic before that. I'm not a whole... But the Trump team alleges phone records of Wade's that they presented last week allegedly show that prior to November of 2021, on multiple occasions, Wade arrived late at night and stayed into the early morning hours. Wade was also asked in court how often he visited Willis at her home before his appointment. Do you think prior to November 1st of 2021, you were at the condo more than 10 times? No, sir. So it would be less than 10 times? Yes, sir. So if phone records were to reflect that you were making phone calls from the same location as the condo before November uh, 1st of 2021, and it was on multiple occasions, the phone records would be wrong? If phone records reflected that, yes, sir. They'd be wrong. They'd be wrong. But Trump's team says analysis of that cell phone data from Wade's phone allegedly demonstrates that he visited Willis at her home at least 35 times in the months before his appointment. And in the weeks immediately after, Willis responded by asking the judge to exclude the phone records, filing, saying in a statement, quote, the records do nothing more than demonstrate that special prosecutor Wade's telephone was located somewhere within a densely populated multiple mile radius where various residences, restaurants, bars, nightclubs and other businesses are located. Our thanks to Von Hilliard for that report. Now to Alabama and the new developments in the ongoing battle over IVF treatments in the state. State legislators are hoping to pass a bill to give immunity to IVF clients and patients after a controversial state Supreme Court ruling that found frozen embryos are children. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park joins us now from Montgomery, Alabama with the latest. Kathy, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning to you. That's right. Later on this morning, hundreds of IVF patients and providers will be here at the State House urging lawmakers to amend the recent ruling. Meanwhile, the governor of Alabama has already signaled that a bill may be on her desk soon. This morning, Alabama lawmakers moving quickly to protecting IVF treatments, weeks after the state Supreme Court ruling that defined a frozen embryo as an unborn child. I anticipate having that. Bill on my desk very shortly. Alabama Republicans introducing bills that would shield IVF clinics from civil and criminal penalties. State Democrats presenting their own measure last week, saying any fertilized human egg or human embryo that exists outside of a human uterus is not considered an unborn child. Amid the scramble to resolve the legality of IVF in the state, at least three fertility clinics have hit pause on treatments, upending the lives of patients. Hannah Miles has been trying to conceive for three years. Having a child for you is priceless. Yes. Yep. You do everything that you can. Because what other choice do you have? Miles was weeks away from a scheduled embryo transfer when the ruling came down. We, more than anyone, know that an embryo does not equal a child because if it did, I'd be pregnant. Her clinic has paused new IVF treatments, but she says her embryo transfer appears to be on track for now. Meanwhile, the impact of Alabama's ruling is even being felt across the country. In Northern California, military wife Heather Marrer says her last embryo is currently with an Alabama clinic that has temporarily paused embryo transfers. I received a phone call from my doctor and I could hear the devastation in her voice. Um, and that's when I knew this isn't happening. Her heartache felt by so many other fertility patients who shared their stories with the nation's top health official, Javier Becerra, in Birmingham. We're trying to figure out at the federal level what we can continue to do to try to be supportive of people who want to access their health care rights. I think it's become pretty clear that this isn't just about abortion. 
And in light of what's happening here in Alabama, Democrats are actually intensifying their IVF messaging. In fact, the DNC started posting billboards across several swing states trying to tie former President Donald Trump with a recent Alabama ruling. Meanwhile, later on today, Senator Tammy Duckworth will be reintroducing her bill on the Senate floor, asking for unanimous consent, essentially asking for federal protections for IVF and reproductive services. Joe? Kathy, thank you so much. Well, turning now to the Midwest, where millions have been impacted by this massive winter storm. Overnight, multiple tornadoes, as well as dangerous hail, was reported in Illinois, causing damage in several areas. And in North Dakota, residents were hit with blizzard conditions, with some areas seeing up to 10 inches of snow and almost 60-mile-an-hour winds. This comes as a disaster declaration has been issued in Texas as at least six wildfires burn through the state's panhandle. NBC News correspondent Adrian Bratis has more. This morning, a fire raging near a nuclear weapons plant as out-of-control wildfires swept through the Texas panhandle. Let's pull out. We got too many spots. Pull out. Pull out. Everybody pull out. And the state's governor issuing a disaster declaration. Concerns growing about the Pantex plant near Amarillo, a nuclear weapons assembly facility. With an uncontained fire nearby, the plant suspending operations overnight. Workers back on site this morning. We are continuing and will continue on the night to ensure that the Pantex plant is protected and safe. Strong winds and dry conditions fueling widespread blazes throughout the state. Meanwhile, wild weather continuing in the Midwest with reported tornadoes in Illinois and Michigan. The dangerous storms splintering structures, leaving them in pieces. It's already been a wild weather week for millions nationwide. To have this kind of dramatic swing that we're having with this wild 55 degree temperature swing, maybe that's what makes this really unique. With more than 100 cities hitting daily record highs this week, including typically chilly Rochester, New York, which tied for its warmest February temperature ever, recorded at 73 degrees. This should be 12 inches of snow on the ground. Some anglers in Missouri even out fishing and not on ice, as extreme weather wreaks havoc for millions across the country. Stand by. And as people are waking up, this is what they are going to see now that the sun is up. I want to point your direction to this partially collapsed apartment building behind me. Bricks have fallen from the roof and now are resting on the ground. Someone's unit here partially exposed. You see the blinds are bent. That's not all. Directly behind me, this tree has been uprooted just the, the branches here, some of them split in half. Indeed. Portions of the Midwest, including here in Illinois, were hammered. Members of the National Weather Service will be out across the region to assess the damage and determine whether or not this was this damage was caused by a tornado or strong winds. Savannah and Joe. All right, Adrian, thank you so much. Some incredible pictures there. Let's get a check on your morning news now, weather. NBC's Angie Lastman joins us with the forecast. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. You heard it there. Weather whiplash when it comes to the severe weather that we're still going to be dealing with through the day today. I'll show you that here in a moment. But also those temperatures, those will get your attention if you are, say, some of the people that were into uh, parts of the Midwest that were well into the 70s yesterday. Uh, Minneapolis, a high of 53 degrees yesterday, now feeling like 14 degrees below. So you definitely need the extra layers this morning across some of those regions that were more shorts and t-shirt focused yesterday. We've got Des Moines into the mid-60s yesterday, now feeling like 11 below. Even Chicago, 74 degrees in Chicago yesterday, breaking a record, blowing it out of the water for a record high, uh, but feeling like just 13 degrees as far as the wind chill is concerned this morning. And these temperatures this afternoon, they will be quite different from what you dealt with yesterday in some of these spots. We're seeing a 46 degree temperature change in the high from yesterday to today in Chicago. We've got just a high of 41 degrees today in St. Louis, more than a 40 degree change as well. And as far south as places like Dallas, just 54 degrees for the high after dealing with 80s and 90s for the past couple of days. 
Meanwhile, a little closer to the coast where that front hasn't officially passed through, we're still going to see temperatures a little above normal. Not quite as impressive as what they were dealing with in the Midwest or parts of the plains, but still 62 degrees in late February. That's above normal for this time of year. We've got 77 on tap for Norfolk and 73 for uh, folks across parts of Virginia. But all good things come to an end, right? Just like the Midwest and parts of the plains, we're going to see these temperatures drop significantly. We're talking about more than a 20 degree drop in New York here by the time we get into tomorrow, a high of just 41 degrees. If you plan on being outdoors today, you're still going to have to deal with some rain across that region. Unfortunately, you won't be able to enjoy those warm temperatures for the East Coast because it's going to march a little farther to the east as the day goes on. But right now, we're seeing that tornado watch that's still in effect through 9 and 10 o'clock across portions of the Ohio and Tennessee valleys. Overnight and into late yesterday, we saw multiple reports of tornadoes, one of them in the Chicago area. That was that's the first in February recorded a tornado on record. So really impressive stuff. Of course, the heat played a big role in this, but this massive storm system continues to work its way to the east through the day today. Not quite as severe of weather that we'll be tracking as far as the hail, the tornadoes and such. Uh, it's not zero, but I think it's more going to be in the way of some stronger storms. But it's really going to affect your commute if you're driving anywhere on I-95 between Boston and Washington, D.C. You're really going to see uh, some heavy rain working through, and unfortunately, it impacts you for that afternoon and evening commute, too. Meanwhile, out west, we're not leaving you out. We've got 6 million people under these winter alerts as another storm system works on shore and brings with it the, the potential for some really impossible travel thanks to some snow. We're talking whiteout conditions here that we could be dealing with across portions of the Sierra and Cascade ranges. We're going to see heavy rain, especially along the coast, uh, and that'll be accompanied by some of those strong winds as well. This is your, how your day-to-day -day plays out. Folks are going to be dealing with that heavy rain from Seattle to Portland down through Medford. Northern California starts to see that impact from that system as we get into tomorrow. And that's where we'll see the really, really impressive snowfall. Whiteout conditions means that we're not just looking at difficult travel for the higher elevations, but uh, low. we're going to see mountain snow um, at the lower elevations, too. So prepare for that. You're, you're going to have a tough go trying to get around in that region um, as we get through at least Sunday. Here's the snowfall totals. Three to five feet, I think, are the, the higher amounts uh, for the more widespread area. But up to 10 feet is going to be possible wow. for the Sierra Mountains. Now, there are running way below normal for this time of year. So we're going to see uh, the potential for them to maybe make up some of that. Um, but it's going to be at the expense of some difficult travel. You can see where we currently stand as far as the snowpack is concerned. 78% for the central Sierra range um, and 94, of course, for the northern Sierra range. But uh, we're below normal because it's been a warm El Nino kind of winter. Uh, so so much needed snow in that mm -hmm. region, but it will make for some difficult conditions over the next Reminder few that days. snowpack is so important because it really affects the yeah. rest of the season when it comes to water, drought, things like that. Exactly. All right. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate it. Thank you. We've got much more to come this hour of Morning News Now, including the TikTok dupes that are saving some savvy social media shoppers some serious cash as inflation continues to tug at our wallets. Plus, Google CEO now in the hot seat apologizing for this, those historically inaccurate pictures that were generated by its AI program. We've got his note to workers coming up. Stay with us. Welcome back. According to a senior U.N. aid official, more than half a million people in Gaza are now one step away from famine. U.N. relief agencies are accusing Israel of denying them access to those in need inside Gaza, while also reporting that aid convoys have come under fire. The desperate humanitarian situation persists as both Israel and Hamas are downplaying comments by President Biden that a ceasefire deal was close. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez has more from Tel Aviv. With the humanitarian crisis in Gaza deepening by the day, both Israel and Hamas now casting serious doubt on President Biden's optimistic assessment that a ceasefire deal could be in place by the start of next week. This morning, as fighting rages on in Gaza, few signs to support President Biden's hope that a ceasefire deal is just days away. And my hope is by next Monday, we'll have a ceasefire. 
Israeli officials tell NBC News they were surprised by the president's comments. And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu releasing a video rejecting Mr. Biden's claim that Israel's far-right government will lose support internationally. While Hamas says there are still significant gaps between the two sides. The White House was pressed if the president spoke too soon. He certainly shared with you his optimism that we can get there in, uh, in hopefully a short order. But he also said, you know, it's not all done yet. With every passing day, fears mounting for the 134 hostages. While in Gaza, the death toll nearing 30,000. And the U.N. warns famine is now looming as Israeli restrictions and a total breakdown in security means it can no longer deliver food to the north of the Strip. The King of Jordan joining an aid mission aboard a military aircraft, dropping food by parachute to desperate crowds gathering on the beaches below. But it's not enough for hundreds of thousands of near-starving people, including 10 members of Umm Qasim's family, trying to survive on flakes of barley. Animals wouldn't eat the food we're now eating, she says. And an Israeli official tells me the talks at this point are effectively at a standstill while they await an official Hamas response to that framework agreement that was hammered out in Paris over the weekend. A Hamas spokesman says they're still studying the proposal, but there are a number of outstanding issues. Back to you. All right, Raf, thank you so much. More international headlines now, starting with developing news this morning about Pope Francis's health. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning. Well, that's right. This morning, the Vatican issued a statement say that, saying that following his general audience, at which he presides every Wednesday, Pope Francis uh, went to a hospital here in the center of Rome for checks, but he has since returned to the Vatican. Now, the statement was very short. He didn't really go into uh, details saying what the problem was, but we know that for the past few days, the Pope has suffered from mild flu symptoms that even forced him to cancel meetings back on Friday and on uh, Monday. Now, uh, this morning at the weekly general audience, he was wheeled on the stage. He stood up while giving his blessing and then spoke briefly, but with a broken voice, telling the faithful, even, apolo follow, uh, even apologizing, that he still had a bit of a cold. Now, let's go to Mexico, where the country's most active volcano once again spewed massive columns of ash and smoke on Tuesday, grounding nearby flights. Ash fall from the most unpronounceable volcano in the world, Popocatepetl, uh, was reported as far as Mexico City which is 45 miles away. Now, Mexico's uh, national, national Center for Disaster Prevention issued a level two volcanic threat level, which requires taking preventive measures and staying a distance away. But the civil protection body said there is currently no risk for the 25 million people who live in a 60 mile radius of the volcano. And let's end this short tour in the world of photography. The Sony World Photography Awards 2024 announced the 30 finalists for this year across 10 categories including sport, landscape and the environment. You've probably seen some of these photos. The shortlistest short photos uh, include an image of a rhino in captivity, a Slovakian spa facility and a German finger wrestling champion. Now the winners will be announced in April and an exhibition of the photos is set to go on display in London's Somerset House. <laughs> wrestling, finger wrestling. I mean, finally a sport that I can compete in, guys. I, I think of it as thumb wrestling, not finger yeah. wrestling, right? Is yeah, that I like know, a, is that like a different <laughs> a different feature? Just, yeah, different. right. All right, Claudio, whatever it is. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, another day in court for Brian Koberger, the man accused of killing those four University of Idaho students back in 2022. Why a date could finally be set for his actual trial to begin, and the importance of DNA evidence to the prosecution's case. We've got the latest up next. Welcome back. Idaho murder suspect Brian Koberger is due back in court for a hearing later today. The judge is expected to set a date for him to face trial, but that could still be more than a year away. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett reports on what we can expect. Hey there. The big question today, how soon Brian Koberger will actually stand trial? His defense team has been successful so far at slowing this case down for more than a year and now wants it moved out of town entirely. But for the families of the four victims, when it happens is more important than where. 
Brian Koberger set to appear back in court today. When and where his trial will ultimately take place, still up in the air. The judge thus far hesitant to set a trial date, but that could all change today. While Koberger's defense team argues he can't get a fair trial unless it's moved out of town. It was here in this close-knit community that four University of Idaho students, Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Zana Carnodal, and Ethan Chapin, were found stabbed to death at home in November of 2022. Facing four counts of first-degree murder, a judge entered a plea of not guilty on Koberger's behalf. Defense motions to get the charges thrown out, consuming the better part of the last year, all swinging in the prosecution's favor. But the judge has held off on setting a date for trial. My heart goes out to the victims. I, I can't even imagine the, the pain, the grief, um, because you can't really go forward with your life is hanging over your head. Prosecutors had asked for it to begin this summer when schools are out, but the defense said that was too soon. Your Honor, summer of 2024, it's impossible for us to do it. Meanwhile, Koberger's defense lawyers filing a motion earlier this month to move the case out of Moscow, citing the extensive inflammatory pretrial publicity. Prosecutors calling that premature. This case has national, if not international, attention. It's not Moscow. It's not Lataw County. It's everywhere. I don't think that a change of venue is going to solve any of these problems. On the eve of last month's hearing, the Gonzalez family told NBC News that pushing the trial another year would be agonizing. My life is put on hold. My life is, um, you know, I in limbo. It's torment. It tears me up. I can't sleep at night. And I just can't imagine going that much longer. Also on the docket today, the court will respond to Koberger's motion to clarify the investigative techniques that were used in the case when it comes to DNA. They will also address granting certain members of Koberger's defense team access to that material. Back to you. All right, Laura, thank you. NBC News Now legal analyst Angela Sanadella joins us with a closer look at this case. Angela, great to have you with us. So what will the judge take into consideration when setting a date and what are the drawbacks of pushing it out another year? So look, the prosecution always wants a faster trial. The defense always wants a slower trial because over the course of time, evidence just tends to deteriorate. Now, what the judge mm. will look at is what the prosecution has asked for, which is this location of the courthouse is right across the street from a school. So thus, all those distractions come along with the school. So the prosecution is trying to push this circus faster and saying, so we have to have this happen this summer. But the defense then took that to their advantage and said, oh, you want a summer trial? Well, guess what? Let's Let's wait till next summer. We won't be ready till then. Now, the judge has to take into account how prepared the defense is in a trial of this massive size. So my guess is that the judge is going to listen to the defense and have hmm. this trial next year. Well, let's talk about the change of venue issue here. Obviously, the defense wants to move this out of Moscow. There's arguments, well, this has received so much national attention. It doesn't really matter where you put it. But the, is there an also an argument that, but this really affected that local community a lot, and therefore he can't get a fair trial? Yeah, it makes sense the defense here is asking for the change of venue based on this potential lack of impartiality. But the bar for change of venue is quite high. It's usually not even just inflammatory press. It's usually inaccurate press. And the defense has to actually mm. submit evidence that shows people have changed their minds because of this press. So to me, it is unlikely that it's met this bar of change of venue. But of course, the defense should try as they are now. Let's talk through the DNA material, how important that is to this case. Also, what that looks like when you say evidence starts to deteriorate over time. Yeah, so this is so interesting because it seems really fancy, but it all comes down to what you and me probably have already done, which is uploading our own DNA sample to public websites like Ancestry.com and like 23andMe. So the prosecution, the investigators started with this type of a public upload, but they didn't disclose that public upload to the defense. So the defense got mad and said, we should know every step of this process. But the prosecution said, no, that's irrelevant. We didn't even use that in the warrant. So that's a question. Now, look, the fact that the prosecution isn't really revealing it all, they won't even tell what websites they used, tends to have the defense be like sniffing something out more. They're like, this is really shady, so why aren't you showing us something that is even public? So that's where you are with that debate. Is this a debate that we see often when it comes to any trials like this, especially with DNA and the way it, as you point out, it is just 
everywhere now, it feels like. That's the exact right question. So you, this happens every day. All of these pretrial motions take up so much time. But in this case, because it's so public, that's why we're seeing all of this. But mm. also, even though this is public, something that you and I may have done, it's also something that's not used that commonly in right. criminal trials. And it tends to be under wraps when they do, because the public gets scared. They start to wonder, well, wait, where is my DNA being used? Mm. All right, Angela Sanadella, thank you so much. All right, so a judge in Illinois has been removed from the bench. He was accused of, quote, intentionally subverting the law to serve his own interests. The removal process began after he reversed his own guilty verdict in a sexual assault case and released the accused attacker of now 18-year-old Cammie Vaughn. Vaughn is now speaking out in an exclusive interview. We are also hearing from the removed judge. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us now from Chicago with more on this exclusive. Hi, Maggie. Good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Yeah, as you know, this kind of punishment, right, removing a judge from the bench is exceedingly rare. And the state oversight board who did it in this case says they did it because they say the judge basically circumvented the law, reversing his own guilty verdict to, they wrote, keep a convicted teen out of prison. Now, the judge this morning is telling a very different story. And meanwhile, as you said, the alleged victim in this case is calling this a major win. And a quick warning, some of what you're about to hear may be disturbing. Cammie Vaughn had all but lost faith in the justice system. Her story began in 2021 in rural Quincy, Illinois, when the then 16-year-old says she was sexually assaulted after drinking and falling asleep at a party. I woke up, had my face covered with a pillow, and I could feel what was happening. The trial was swift, with Circuit Court Judge Robert Adrian finding 18-year-old Drew Clinton guilty of criminal sexual assault. The minimum sentence, four years in prison. At the sentencing hearing, a stunning twist. According to court transcripts, Judge Adrian said there is no way for what happened in this case that this teenager should go to the Department of Corrections. Adding Clinton's almost five months already served in jail was plenty of punishment. The judge then reversing his own verdict, finding Clinton not guilty. There was no new evidence, nothing new to make him change his mind. Protests and petitions demanded the judge's removal. Public pressure culminating with a hearing from the Illinois Courts Commission. That commission has now removed you from the bench. Yes. Today, the former judge stands by his reversal, but now says he did it after revisiting the evidence. Once I did that, I saw that I'd made a mistake. I didn't believe her. She. You don't she, believe her? Yes, I didn't believe her. The commission saying they don't believe him, writing Adrian intentionally subverted the law and then lied about it under oath to serve his own interests. They're saying you tried to cover up your mistake. I did. By lying later. I didn't. And if they would have looked at the evidence in the case, then they would have seen that he was not guilty. So it's simpler just to sacrifice a poor judge than it is for them to stand up against the mob. Now 18, Cammie maintains she was assaulted and says she's glad the judge is gone. I didn't have much faith in the justice system because of what he had done, but it has definitely been restored. And we should note Drew Clinton, the former defendant in this case, has declined to comment for this story, but through an attorney, still maintains his innocence. Meanwhile, Cammy, who you just heard from there, has since moved out of state. She's graduated high school and she started a new job. Moving forward, she says, Savannah, stronger than ever. Mm. All right, Maggie Vespa, thank you so much. Coming up, dupes for deals. After the break, the savvy social media surfers who are cashing in on cheaper brands all to fight inflation. More on that next. Welcome back. If you own your house, you may have noticed recently a spike in your monthly homeowner's insurance premium. Many parts of the country have seen rates increase as much as 20 percent. Well, reporter Linda Picaro from our affiliate WNBC here in New York explains what's driving up the cost and has some ideas to save you money. The next time your home insurance policy renews, prepare to pay more. Many premiums are going up. I did not figure it out on a percentage basis, but at least 10, 15 percent maybe. What do you think about homeowner insurance premiums going up? I think it's a problem, especially if you don't have a lot of claims. What's driving that increase? The first one is inflation. 
the cost of home improvement materials has gone up in the past few years. We're talking everything from roof tiles to lumber to appliances. And insurers are seeing a greater number of costly disasters. Michael Barry is chief communications officer with the Insurance Information Institute. The federal government announced that year in 20. 23 that this was the first year meaning last year where they had seen so many one billion dollar events there were 28 in all if your premium does go up here are some ideas to consider to help save money if you're in a position to raise your deductible um it, right away that you're going to see premium rate savings um then you, you also uh, should probably bundle your auto and home together if you're not already Ask about discounts for making your home more resistant to disasters. Yeah, that might be installing uh, storm shutters or a, uh, a wind-resistant garage door. Annette Marie decided to compare homeowner insurance premiums. Because of the increase, I actually had to go shopping and shift, and so I switched companies. Our thanks to WNBC's Linda Becerra. So as prices rise, shoppers are leaving designer labels and premium products behind, and they're looking for cheaper alternatives. Yeah, now the trend of finding the best duplicates, or dupes, is taking the Internet by storm. NBC News senior business correspondent <laughs> Christine Romans joins us now with a guide to what's actually worth swapping out to save money. Hey, Christine. Good morning, you guys. Look, the hashtag dupe has almost 6 billion views just on TikTok. And it's a craze not only picked up on social media, but by businesses themselves themselves as inflation puts a dent into consumers pockets everyone everyone is looking for the best deal regardless of brand after three years of high inflation american consumers are chasing cheap and bragging about it online elf is in their dupe era let's compare a five dollar stanley cup dupe i found at five below to the real thing they're talking about dupes, short for duplicates, low-cost alternatives to pricey consumer goods. From makeup to peanut butter to designer bags, they're seeking out store brands and cheap alternatives. Dupes and affordable alternatives to Charlotte Tilbury. Abby Rivera shares her favorite dupes and products on TikTok. She says her 295,000 followers have a big interest in getting the most bang for their buck. This is about finding something great for the lowest possible price. And people right now especially are looking to get what they want, but for a cheaper price, because we all know prices for everything is going up and up and up. And if they can get a similar product for $10 instead of spending 45, they're going to be very happy to get that $10 product. For example, Anthropology's best-selling Gleaming Primrose Mirror will run you $548, but the Walmart version will cost only $55 when you buy it online. Younger shoppers are driving this trend. They're less brand loyal than their parents and grandparents. It's almost a stamp of approval. It's a documentation or a demonstration that you said you went out and found an item that is of near or equal value for a lower price. And after dealing with higher prices for years, consumers now have the upper hand and companies know it. The CEO of Kraft Heinz recently saying, We also recognize that the consumers are looking for better value in all the choices they're making. Overall prices are up 19% since January 2020, with grocery bills skyrocketing 25%, leaving consumers on the hunt for cheaper alternatives. I'm just not paying Tyson prices prices if I don't have to. Buying store brand items and even grocery store dupes. You hear videos on TikTok not just about makeup and skincare, but people complaining about the cost of living, the cost of the grocery store, the cost at restaurants. They would like to get the cheapest option, but it's still a Nine, good two, option. Nine. So clearly this is driven by social media, yeah. by Gen Z, but I have to imagine, does it go beyond online searches? It does. It really does here. It's not just Gen Z looking for the bargains these days. One study of my morning consult found about a third of all adults, a third of adults intentionally bought dupes of premium products at some point. Mm. The younger demographic, though, like Gen Z and millennials, they do it at a higher rate, about 49% for Gen Z and 44% for millennials. Um, and, and look, one expert told us we could see this trend go mainstream across all generations as information becomes easier, right? As you can just go online and you can just listen to a video and hear somebody, you know, point you to the Target Up and Up brand that's the right. cheapest of something else and, and people go for it. I do like that Up and Up brand. So They're I expanding that. to 2,000 yeah. products because look, wow. look, these CEOs know that people want cheap. You see, 
it's like flipping the script on the old Keeping Up with the Joneses. Oh, mm. they've got a Cadillac. I need a Cadillac. It's the opposite right, now. Got... It's like they got it cheaper. I want to get it cheaper. <laughs> I'll tell you what they're not buying, though, dupes. Mm. Electronics and jewelry. The big categories are apparel, home goods, beauty, but not electronics and jewelry. That's where people draw their line, especially the younger generation. They want the real thing with the real brand. Uh -huh. Yeah, and some of those, like the Stanley Cup and all that kind of stuff, it's like, depends on who you are, I think, because yep. it's such a thing online. Christine? It's just a cup. Yeah. It's just a cup. He doesn't <laughs> get that one. And it's cool to be cheap. I love it. It's cool to be cheap. Yeah, exactly. it's cool. Thank you, Christine. You're welcome. Appreciate it. It's now let's cup. get to some other financial headlines. Google is in some hot water this morning over some controversial AI images. CNBC Savannah Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning to you. Yes, so Google CEO Sundar Pichai says historically inaccurate images and text generated by its Gemini AI are completely unacceptable. He made the apology. He made the apology in an internal memo seen by several media outlets. Last week, Google paused Gemini's ability to generate images after it was discovered the model created pictures of founding fathers who weren't white and even the wrong races of Google's co-founders. Pichai says the company is working around the clock to address the, quote, problematic text and image responses, but isn't saying whether they've been fixed. Starbucks and a union seeking to organize the company's workforce have agreed to a framework to guide their collective bargaining and potentially settle several legal disputes. Workers United began a nationwide campaign in 2021, leading workers unionizing at nearly 400 of Starbucks' 9,000 U.S. stores. As a sign of good faith, Starbucks has agreed to provide union workers with benefits that were given to non-union employees in 2022, and those include being able to receive tips from credit card transactions. And Elon Musk says Tesla aims to ship its Roadster electric sports car next year. In a post on X, Musk says the Roadster's design will be completed and unveiled by the end of 2024. This year, of course, Tesla first announced the four-seater Roadster in 2017 with an original launch for 2020. But Musk pushed that date to 2023 exciting supply chain issues guys all right Silvana, thank you so much you got it coming up skating into history after the break the trail blazing or should i say ice blazing duo at one hbcu who are bringing their figure skating roots to the national stage more on that up next We are back with an interesting take on a bed and breakfast on this National Pancake Day. Happy Pancake Day to all who celebrate. You should grab your syrup and your butter for what Kellogg's is calling the Ego House of Pancakes in Tennessee. You heard that right. It is a house that's been renovated to look like a stack of pancakes with a chimney shaped like a stick of butter, beds that look like fluffy flapjacks, and of course, a maple syrup fountain. Starting today, you can book a stay at the Ego House of Pancakes through the vacation rental platform, Home to go, as expected, guests will arrive to a fridge just full of egos. Like, oh, my ego. Well, we're talking about breakfast, Savannah. Why don't pancakes like horror movies? You know, this time the answer is not in the prompter, and I do not know. I took it out of the prompter. That's why. <laughs> because they give them the crepes. <laughs> Cute. Like it. Thanks, Joan. We end this hour in Washington, D.C. Two Howard University students who fell in love with figure skating as little girls were upset that their school didn't have a team, so they created one. NBC News correspondent Yamiche Alcindor spoke with the skaters about breaking barriers on the ice. These Howard University students are skating into history. Not out there skating, I just feel very free. I like that you have to keep going, so you fall a lot, but you had to kit back up. Maya James and Cheyenne Walker grew up figure skating, but when they got to Howard, there wasn't a team. So they set out to change that. Why did you want to start a skating club at Howard? Because growing up, I didn't have that much of a community um, of like people around my age that look like me. I grew up knowing that we had a place on the ice, so I just want to bring that same sentiment to Howard. Together, they petitioned Howard to approve and support a team, becoming the first ever at a historically black college or university. There's so many historical things that have happened at Howard University, and now you're part of that rich history. What's that feel like? Becoming a part of that legacy is just an overwhelming feeling of pride. The team began competing earlier this month. It's really amazing to see how quickly people can pick up the skills. I feel like such a proud mom. Why do you think more Black people aren't participating in figure skating? I think it could be 
the rep lack of representation. And I think the cost could be another factor, but um, we're so happy that Howard funded us for Ice Time. Now, the two hope others will follow. I just hope to inspire uh, any black or brown little girls or boys out there that want to continue figure skating. And honestly, I hope to inspire other HBCUs or diverse institutions. Bringing new inspiration to the ice. <laughs> Yami Shalsendor, NBC News, Washington, D.C. Very cool. Love to see that. Sorry, yeah, it just if you want it, you do it yourself. Exactly. Our team. It's <laughs> Get awesome. It done. Good for them. That's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.